I will turn it over to Dr. Beth Cattleman. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this exciting conversation with the co-founders of Flux and Flow, a dance company that creates intergenerational work with dancers of all ages. Their most recent work includes intergenerational cast members who have been working from home during this pandemic. You'll hear a lot more about that in just a moment. But before I turn it over to Mara Frazier, our curator of dance and Flux and Flow co-founders, I'd like to let you know about one of the collections we have here at the Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee Theater Research Institute at The Ohio State University that is also devoted to intergenerational performance. It's the Grandparents Living Theater Collection. Next slide, please. Grandparents Living Theater was a Columbus, Ohio-based semi-professional theater founded in 1985 that created and produced theater devoted to challenging images of aging and celebrating life experience using actors of all ages for audiences of all ages. The company was founded by Dr. Joy Riley, who at the time was a faculty member in the Department of Theater at The Ohio State University, and had also been working as a theater critic for WOSU Radio since 1978. In 1984, Riley began interviewing senior citizens for her talk show and decided that the stories she was gathering were so interesting that they deserved to be shared in a performance. So in 1985, she founded Grandparents Living Theater and became its first artistic director and remained in that position until 1998. The troupe initially began performing original scripts put together by Riley from oral histories, ideas, and memories shared by troop members. One of their most successful productions was, I was young, now I'm wonderful. Here you see a poster from that show, a photo of John Schmidt in performance, and an invitation to a special performance at Columbus State Community College. Just a few of the artifacts that reside in the collection. The company quickly gained international and national recognition, performing in Germany, taking part in the first National Senior Adult Theater Festival held in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1993, and winning several awards, including a local Emmy Award for the PBS broadcast of their production, I Was Young, Now I'm Wonderful. The group is also featured in Ann Davis Besting's book, the Stages of Age, published by the University of Michigan Press in 1998. In 1999, the troupe changed its name to Senior Repertory of Ohio Theater, SRO. The company continued to create theater meant to enhance positive images of aging. And in addition to performing original works, they also took on some classics such as Death of a Salesman and Driving Miss Daisy. Unfortunately, the company ceased production in 2015, but they left a strong legacy of intergenerational performance here in Columbus, Ohio. And the Lawrence and Lee Theater Research Institute is proud to be able to make their archives available for research. The collection consists of over 100 boxes of publicity, photographs, administrative files, scripts, show notes, newspaper clippings, and much more. It is open to researchers, so if you're interested in intergenerational theater, this is the collection for you. To find out more, please contact me, Beth Cattleman, at cattleman.1 at osu.edu. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Mara Frazier, curator of dance, to welcome our guests from Flux and Flow, who will talk a bit more about their work with intergenerational performance and their other projects. Take it away, Mara. Thanks so much, Beth. Hello, I am Mara Frazier. As Beth, Dr. Beth Cattleman said, I'm curator of dance. 
at Ohio State. I want to welcome and briefly introduce Russell and Filippo Lovely Palaki and their work with Flux and Flow. Russell and Filippo started Flux and Flow in 2017 in the heart of Clintonville. Flux and Flow Dance Project is the home for their choreographic work, which has garnered numerous awards, including an Ohio Arts Council 2020 Individual Excellence Award. And they have received numerous commissions as well from the Wexner Center for the Arts and the Greater Columbus Arts Council, among others. Here's an image of, on the right, Russell performing in their 2019 work, Ursula. And on the left is, um, is Flux and Flow Dance Project, the professional dancers performing in um, 2018's Red Patience and Russell, or Filippo, sorry, Filippo is the one with his beautiful extension in the air. In addition to the project, Lepley and Palaki own Flux and Flow Dance Center. This is a community dance studio in the heart of Clintonville, Columbus, Ohio, in the Crestview neighborhood. The Dance Center offers classes in ballet, contemporary, Afro-pop, hip-hop, children's dance, and yoga in a supportive, welcoming environment. The studio also contains an art gallery with rotating exhibits and offers space for movement wor workshops, acting as a community center. Here's an image on the right of Russell rehearsing with students of the center who were featured in the work Lovely and Awful in 2019 and the students performing the work on the left. Now let's go ahead and get to our discussion, the, um, the fun part here. We're going to have a conversation. Hi, Hi Russell. Hi, Filippo. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank, thank you, Mara, and thank you, Beth, for that introduction. And thanks, OSU Libraries, for having us here today. I'm happy to We're so happy to have you. So tell us a bit about Flux and Flow. What is Flux and Flow Dance and Movement Center? What is the project in your own words? And how did they come to be? Um, so the center um, is a space for dance, movement, and general creative experiences for people of um, everyone, really. It's, our goal is to be as inclusive as possible at all times. Um, we started this space about three and a half years ago, um, initially knowing we really wanted to make a space that was geared more towards adults um, and a space that m allowed people to um, connect with dance without the intimidation that sometimes comes along with dance mm -hmm. uh, and comes from kind of dance culture a lot yeah. of times. So um, we're also, we're performing artists professionally for about 10 years prior to opening the business. And we found pretty early on that we were missing that creative piece. So uh, Flux Flow Dance Project kind of happened organically with us just needing to create and be creative. Um, and so we do work sometimes with, um, you know, professional dancers or professional performers. And then other times um, with our community members that we've, this you know, beautiful community that we've developed. And then also sometimes kind of collaborating and working together. And we allow that kind of balance to kind of complement one another. Um, do you have something else to add? No, that's it, yeah. That's yeah. what Beth was talking about, you know, age. And for us, age yeah, is something that um, is, falls into the category of like, what is, um, what is um, appropriate to, 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 when is appropriate to dance? For example, what age is appropriate to dance? What do you look, what do you, you know, how do you look like? All of this kind of stuff. So for us, like age was something important to include and make our classes available to people of all ages, for example. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I would love it if you would talk a bit about your own backgrounds and your artistic influences, your, um, your technical influences, kind of what has shaped you as performers, as artists. And also, um, this is a lot in one question, but um, as teachers as well, beyond just the desire to build a welcoming community, um, tell us about 
your background in dance. And music. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm Italian. So I was born in Florence, Italy. And I started, um, I was swimming before when I was a kid. And then when I went to middle school, I started to get uh, more serious about my passion for music that it was always there. And I started to get uh, piano lessons. And for me, it was always about the movement. I was never a reader for music. I was always a learner by ear and put it in my body and I would just like it was it was body memory you know movement memory and then uh, because of that some friends and of course um, you know was it like 20 years ago or something um, you know dance another limitation was like you're you're a man you're a boy this is not for you so I started because some uh, of my friends were going to dance and I was like, well, but what do you do? And they were like, it's contemporary dance. I was like, what is contemporary dance? And they were like, well, you, pl uh, like you dance with like bird sounds. That was, the, <laughs> that was their description. And I was like, this sounds awesome. So I was like, yes, let's do it. So I went to it and I quickly realized that, that that was really, it was a really great tool for me to express stuff that maybe were limited with sitting, being seated on a piano, for example. And I kind of transitioned in liking it more the technical aspect and that what brought me to ballet. And I was really lucky because the school that I started with was super um, understanding and kind of like it, they guided me through what was, what was going to be healthy and what was going to be um, beneficial for me and kind of take like you know help me away from other stuff that they knew that maybe not so yeah so then I after a few years I kind of had to decide it and like a funny story that I had booked both auditions I had an audition for the conservatory of music and addition, an audition for a, um, for a school in Switzerland and I kind of did both of them at the same time and then the last minute I decided that um, dance is what I wanted it and it was more rounded at, them, at that point for me and so I ended up in France and I kind of went through like a, a traditional like contemporary career in, in Europe and yeah and then um, moving company like you know moving companies is pretty common and it always it's Every dancer, every professional dancer, any artist in general has like a cycle of experimenting with something, right? And like company have such a um, um, specific and particular vibe. And then at one point I was just ready to move on and I ended up in Munich where we met. And we were kind of both at the same stage where we were moving from a company that um, we have taken everything that we could or that we wanted to. And so we were also, I was, I was at, a, uh, at a point where I wanted to take back what um, music, the music that was in me, you know, the, the, and the theater and like other kind of like expressions like dance started a little bit more, it was a little bit tight for me to, uh, for example, like get till here with my movement and then my voice needed to stop you know what I mean for example like those kind of barriers that it's like why why is that so like Munich the company Munich helped me and I think us and other dancers in the company a lot to kind of merge those two things together and then um, my cycle was over again and I started to to kind of be curious of what was around and one thing that it honestly started because I was in Germany, Russ was still in the company and I need, needed it to, to have time for myself. And I was like, what do I do? And I started teaching. It started like casually like that. And I started teaching to an adult space. And for me, it was just such a, there's a big stigma. Let's put it that way. There's a big stigma, stigma in the dance, professional dance world that if you teach or if you become a teacher, it means that you didn't make it as a dancer or you know that kind of that kind of mentality and and that's all I knew so I was I was like but let me check and then I started and for me it was such a re revelation and it, it it not only I was feeling that that time in the evening that I was sharing with those people was 
something so special for everyone in the room, including me, but it also gave me like a lot of, um, it helped me like my self-esteem so much because I was like, okay, this is, this is what I have and nobody can take or away from me. Like nobody, no any director, any critic, not, nobody. And, and I can share. So there was something that suddenly every, like all of the stuff that I ate were ready to come out. And, and that's when I was like, okay, this is, this is what we can do. You know, we can have like, we can be our own artists and we can share in our terms what we want and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's all your question in one big thing. <laughs> yeah. And I, we have a lot of common things, but also some like nice complementary, you know, different intersecting points that makes it nice for us to work with each other. Um, I started out doing, I started out in dance like from when I was five, but also really into musical theater and theater in general. Um, so, uh, and then similarly, you know, at a certain age when it was kind of time to think about, okay, if I really want to pursue this professionally, what am I going to decide to focus on? And I decided to focus on um, dance and specifically classical ballet. I got really into the classical ballet world and I um, was with um, like Houston Ballet too and then Le Grand uh, Ballet. So my first two jobs were really like strictly classical companies um, but I would say that like, you know, Philippa talked about how healthy his teacher teachers were. And I had a lot of really unhealthy environments that I was in, in my, um, late teens and early twenties. And that, I think that both of those things like kind of came into our teaching because there were so many things that I experienced that I, and I saw people experience that I was so not okay with that, um, the idea of becoming a teacher that felt like a lot of responsibility to make sure that um, to teach in a way that was different from that aspect and to really like work against a lot of the um, unhealthy mentality that can come out of these competitive high pressure environments. Um, and so within ballet, it was fun for a while because it's, it's, you know, there is all of that challenge and that technique, but I started to feel um, like really constrained by, uh, what I could do artistically with ballet. And I lived in Montreal, which I was in a classical ballet company, but Montreal has this amazing theater, music, everything mixed together scene. So I was seeing all of these shows, they'd have all of these festivals. And um, I you know, was seeing like dance theater artists from Belgium come in. It was just this whole eye-opening three years of my life where I absorbed a lot of ideas about what performance could be that I just didn't know it could be really. Um, and so from there, I got interested really in contemporary dance and that's why I moved to Germany and was working in contemporary dance companies. Um, and yeah, I think we both felt at some point that as artists, we wanted to have, um, you know, more autonomy and also even like the, very, the last place that we worked together, the director was really kind, he had a good heart, it was really a good person and he treated the dancers well. And, um, but nonetheless, I remember we had a choreographer who was, you know, like you would have guest choreographers come in and we had a choreographer and he was just treating people terribly. And I was just like, I'm done doing this and putting my, it's like, even if I found a director that I like, he might bring someone in and then I'm this, I'm a victim of this environment. I just like, wasn't okay with it anymore. Um, I can add like a little, like a lot of time in dance company, which is always interesting, especially in like a European company where you have like the theater department, the orchestra, the dance, like the dance department, especially the dancers are always kind of like at the bottom yeah. of it. And I think it's because it's a fairly young um, environment with like a lot of young people coming in and there's it's so competitive in school so you come in with like eager to do anything and to pull up with a lot of things so it's like a lot of time we felt that even though the director was creating a nice environment a, a choreographer guest choreographer will come in and there would always be somebody who would be fine with things that in our opinion they shouldn't be fine with and then it was really hard to grow up in a place like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I think that the decision to come here, because Filippo started teaching and he was, and I was kind of like, I was like, you know, I knew that that lifestyle wasn't making me happy, but I 
it was hard to kind of pass through like, okay, so like this idea of really building our own thing was intimidating, but then seeing how satisfied you were with teaching and, um, and just kind of having this trust of knowing that I had a, um, built this partnership with somebody mm-hmm. who I really felt like we had the ability together to, um, to help each other do this. And I felt mm-hmm. confident to do that with Filippo. Um, so coming here, it's like we get to um, share all of the experiences that we had as dancers professionally with the community, try to do it in a healthy way, and then also make work that doesn't get us um, pigeonholed in one way. Yeah. So we can do work that's more theatrical sometimes, more that's just movement-based, um, gender roles not having to be so clear and codified. Um, a lot of things that I had always kind of hoped for in um, you know, dance company lifestyle, we were able to reinvent here. Yeah. And so we try to bring um, that whenever we're making work and when we're teaching. This is something like, yeah, to don't give for granted at all. That is like, there's so much gender um, classification and like in dance and, um, and just partnering, you know, like even, even if you think about a duet and then you think about the male figure lifting the female figure, just because I don't, it's not just about weight. It's about the fairy and the warrior, you know, and like, and we try to put the fairy and the warrior together and make a fairy warrior. (laughs) 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 So, and, and and there's, um, we were saying about like the technique and especially in ballet or in any form that has like a strong structure and a strong technique. Um, There's a difference of trying to um, copy or to recreate what you're seeing. And a lot of time we learn that way, but what we focus a lot in our classes is how do we put that shape, that feeling, that movement quality, that visual movement in our body and how is that becoming a tool for us to express? Because there's always a moment of like mind and body conversation. And I always say it's like a really, it, I always tell in class that it's, always, it's like a relationship with somebody, like a romantic relationship. Somehow you talk and you're like, yes. Sometimes you talk and you're like, mm, no. And sometimes like the brain knows it, the body doesn't. Sometimes the body knows it, the brain doesn't. So like, it's really that conversation and how you take things inside, how you digest them, how you bring them out, that is what interests us so much. And when we see people becoming artists and they are <coughs> inspiring us so much to make work and work with them. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, so that's the thing that we're the most interested in as we share dance. I would say too, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that, um, that you're really bringing a new audience into into dance you're welcoming people into dance that are um, not just of all ages but as you said genders gender expression also body shape and ability which is another area that um, has had a lot of um, pre kind of predetermined ideas in the dance world of what you need to look like and how you need to be built and um, race, gender, kind of that whole physical expression. And <clears throat> having, um, having attended a few of Russ and Filippo's classes as a student, I can definitely vouch for um, kind of that it's not, it's not a, they teach with the same level of sophistication that they're talking about their work now. So um, just because the dancers are beginning dancers doesn't mean that it's, um, it's a dumbed down experience or that it's separate from the world of your professional work. I really feel that you, um, you make it accessible at the same time as, um, as making it a real experience of dance, an authentic experience of dance. And just one little story. Um, I, I have a lifelong relationship with movement practice and dance. And I remember at one point coming into your class as a student, and I was in that point with ballet where we were on the outs. Like you said, like it's like a marriage and romantic relationship, maybe not marriage, but, um, and I was able to do ballet the way you were doing it. And I hear this from your students as well too. It's, um, it's a long tradition, but 
if you take away the, some of the parts of it that are harmful or overly prescriptive, it, there's still so much beauty there. And so I think that is something that you make available that I, that I love. Thank you. That means, that means a lot. It's, it's really important for us. And yeah, and it's true what you're saying is like, it's not about making accessible, meaning take out the experience. That's not how we make it accessible. That's not the point. For example, a tandu, which is a long leg lengthening, for example, to the front, keeping the toes on the floor while you're standing strong on your standing leg, no matter where you limit and limits in our body are so specific and they're so personal, no matter where your point of feeling the ah, moment is, that's what we want you to be, you know what I mean? Because it's not so much of like how open you can be because that's not going to bring you the joy that maybe brings to someone else. It's like, where is that point that brings you the joy and where can you leave with, with ballet, for example, or other? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think what's interesting, um, yeah. and maybe I'm getting to another subject, but uh, we kind of realize by teaching people ballet and teaching people contemporary, like teaching our classes, how capable they were of approaching these really complex ideas. And then I think that's what the kind of choreography with them grew out of, because we um, got commissioned to do a um, short piece on some ballet Met dancers for the, it was like a benefit for the National um, Hemophilia Foundation. Um, and it was like kind of like a soft piece, but like very detail oriented. And people from the studio came and saw the performance and they were like, oh, that was beautiful. I wish I could do that. And I was like, you all can. And so from that conversation, we're like, well, why don't we just do that piece with you all? Because we knew we were going to do like a small performance of something where like we can like, um, you know, share this. And, and we were able to like have the really rich complexity and approach of like kind of identifying specific body parts and having this thing of it, um, having like the kind of demanding of yourself to push towards like what the, the edge of your possibilities are, but in a way that's like respectful of what your edge is. Um, and it was really, it's really interesting that the way that we work with um, professional dancers is really the same way that we work with our adults and it's amazingly transferable because it's just about being able to um, communicate those ideas in a way that's um, like I guess yeah in a way that's clear for them and if they really understand what the task is and they're approaching it with that specificity and intensity it's just as effective for an audience and sometimes it's more effective like the piece that we did with them um, that was the same as the ballet met was just as um, emotional and maybe more so because yeah. of it for different reasons and it had like it was the same piece but there was a really different experience watching the two um yeah the two pieces and, and we appreciate that like it's interesting what um the people we work with bring to our work and it's something that we couldn't do with another community yeah but i had to add to this point is it's because um something that studying this whole space and be more connected with people because at the end like it's really easy to get in your bubble when you're in a dance company or in the dance professional world one of the things that we influence us the most as artists and when we make work is the um, human approach and the relationship with people and the diversity of people coming from different backgrounds ages gender and so on and um that if 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 we can if we can treat people as artists as, as individuals they can express then it doesn't become a dance it becomes human being there are dancing and and it's really different and this happens in class it can happen just like in in a normal class you know what i mean regular class like it's beautiful to see a human being dancing and that's where it kind of like yeah. the shift happens yeah yeah as opposed to taking out the humanity so that some technical move can be accomplished yeah. so, um i have i have one more um kind of question area for you and then we're going to shift over to q a i'm seeing a few questions come in um but 
Can you, my last question is really, can you talk more about what has happened to that work with the community and your professional work since COVID? Um, the elephant in the room, that's mm -hmm. the reason we, it's so great that we get to be virtual, but we, we hadn't really thought of doing things like this until we were isolated in the way that we are. So how are you continuing to make, are you continuing to make work and how right now? And how is that for you? So before, I mean, it, this was like for everyone, uh, a shift in life and a shift um, specifically in our case as artists, because um, a lot of it, um, I always say like, if I can't eat, I, I, you know, I can't put it out again, you know? And like, I was, there was a point that we were just pausing. So it was really hard for us to find things to bring in and to mix into something. But on the other hand, we started pretty much at the beginning of, of the quarantine with the, with the project. We, we, so like the week after everything shut down, um, we decided, okay, we really felt that as a community, um, we needed something to, to keep us positive and connected. And, and connected. So we were like, let's just say, we're gonna have rehearsals for a performance that's gonna happen someday, somewhere. And we had no idea really what we were doing, but we were gonna meet twice a week for two hours on Sunday and an hour on um, Tuesdays. And we've been doing that since March. Um, we ended up deciding not to try to make a live performance happen. What we're doing now is a video uh, film project out of what we have been um, working on. And we just started filming. We're filming um, on Sundays at the Park of Roses outdoors until the end of October. Um, Possibly end of this. We summer. all have <laughs> socially distanced masks. We have a duet happening with you know, eight foot poles that we, so we can have this idea of moving together, but with, um, with distance and um, it's been, but it's been really challenging. I would say normally we are also within this span of time, Filippo and I would have probably also worked on something as performers or as dancers. And that piece we have, I felt like just with managing the space and also we have enough of a creative outlet through this project that we're now planning something to get started with in the next month or so but we had a moment that was just kind of like absorbing and trying to like be with what is happening in the world which is you know more than coronavirus too also um there's a lot of things happening socially that are important um and that's also been interesting for our process um i think it's kind of interesting to mention we the concept for the piece because I was like, well, we all feel like we're helpless, but we are fighting against this thing, or we have this, you know, there were, you know, people, and I think the governor was call, saying that we're like fighting against an enemy with COVID. So was this, there was this idea of that terminology being used. So we had like a pot lid and a spatula, and we were going to build like kind of homemade armor, and we were going to be this group kind of united in fear, kind of like not very efficiently Nipped. fighting off some unknown um, enemy. So not specifically coronavirus, but, um, and, and in the kind of plot we developed, like the group kind of got separated in the fog, you know, and then re-met and didn't recognize each other and was gonna get into this conflict. Um, and three months into making this concept, you know, the protests um, started happening and we started seeing people almost creating armor out of things from their home. And, um, and so the whole tone of what we were making felt strange and maybe not appropriate in the same way. Um, so that's been, and it's something that we're still um, trying to figure out the balance with. And it's something we've talked about a lot as a group and um, and something that we still have doubts about, but we're, we feel like we have found a direction that um, feels respectful. And also like is a, it's a way for us to process and talk about what we're experiencing, but it's definitely the most that we've felt. Um, actually, somebody who's watching, I saw them say something in the chat, Pat had said, it's like we're making work without the, like without perspective, because a lot of times you make something about maybe like a ex previous experience. A lot of work, like Ursula, what we did was a lot about what it was like to be a dancer in a, in a company or a dancer or an in artist, dance. Or an artist, yeah. yeah, but it was drawing from 
for me when I was thinking about things, like a really personal thing in the past that I had distance from. Yeah. Whereas this one, it feels like we're talking about conflict, um, talking about fear in a way that's like, that we don't have as we don't have distance from. So that's been very challenging, um, but it's an interesting thing for us to do as a group. And a resolution. Like for a lot of time we're like, what is it, the end? Like, what is the, what is, how is this piece or this process, how is it gonna end? Like, what is the end of it? And, and yeah, it, 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 was, it was challenging, but it was challenging in a good way. Because it, it kind of like forced us to convert, like to have a conversation with the with everyone that was involved, and we have 24 people, by the way, which yeah. which is amazing. We started out with um, 40 people with the initial rehearsal, and then of course, like it's been six months, and so much has happened that people have had to. Um, but we still have 24 people, and um, and and it's just been really like wonderful to be able to kind of count on those people on a weekly basis and to have each other in our lives as we're going through this moment that's and this is it's something that like we feel so grateful and talking for example to um you know Mathilde and Dario which are like you know dancers that other professional dancers friends of ours and everyone is so impressed and like and so no I wouldn't say surprised but like they admire the fact that like the community is so Dedicated. trusting of yeah. each other and and it's we don't give that for granted like at all like the the fact that we have that we're in a project where 24 people and and then us are all in it together and all in it with the same like idea and mentality and trust with each other it it's incredible it's amazing so thank you yes I, I think that experience really I mean Russell was talking about not being able to get distance from the work because the part of the thematic content is this um, dualism or this kind of aggressive fighting spirit and I think we are in a time where we can't get distance from our context we're all in it even if we some of us were staying on the sidelines before from say the Black Lives Matter movement from um, politics um, we might have been able to if we're if we're able to in the past we might have been able to say this isn't my problem or I'm not political with family and it feels harder now you you find yourself the people that you have always been with and love maybe suddenly you're looking at them oppositionally. Yeah. And so even if this dance didn't arrive that way intentionally, um, that may have been a trite way to arrive at that content, but uh, even just the experience for the performers of working through that in a way that as a scenario and not at family dinner on Sunday <laughs> um, or in, at work or in another setting, I think is healing and important right now. So I think, and just being outside, dancing outside, I think is something that people need. So I can see the value that um, is kind of being added there. So that's exciting. Um, I would love to um, open up the Q&A to questions. Um, I want to be respectful of time and just a few things too in the chat that I've noticed. We do need to mention where people can find you, like find out about the work that you're making when it does come out, um, but also if people want to take classes. So I think I would say the best way is to go to your website, am I right? Um, flux-flow.com, right? Yes. Um, and the mind body app is um, is how to sign up for classes. Please add if I if I'm missing anything. Yeah, you can do you can actually do everything from the website. If you go to schedule, if you go to classes weekly schedule, then you can the system will guide you will guide you through everything. So on the website you have all the information. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so okay, so questions. Um, so if you have questions, please add them to the Q and A. And for the first question, um, how and why did you end up living and working in Columbus, Ohio? We heard Munich, we heard Austin, we heard Italy. So um, why Columbus? And then what do you like about being here? Well, I'm from Columbus, so I should have mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I grew up here. I left when I was 17, but the first 17 years of my life were in Columbus and all of my family is here. Um, so I was gone for 11 years. And it was it's funny because I really, 
wasn't sure if I wanted to move back. And it was actually Filippo's idea because there was a part of really feeling when I was younger that I wanted to kind of escape um, because I grew up in an environment that was um, a lot different than like the values that I you know, grew into, let's say. So I knew that coming back would, um, I would have to kind of confront all of that. So, but it was really good that I did and I'm really glad that we did. Um, and it was, I think, Filippo, you really saw the potential. You were like, you were like, I think you're just, you know, scared to move back. But. Well, yeah, I understand it because, I mean, I can understand what you're going through because for me it was the same that I didn't want to move to Florence because sometimes, I mean, we both left at the same time, like 16, 17. So if you live like half of your life away and in multiple countries, coming back to one specific country, particularly a country that you know the culture so well, you know when you're going to be judged, you know how you're going to be judged, you know what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, feels really restrictive and 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 secondly, like adding what you know about that country that you're gonna go back, like when you know which the community that you know, and like you're thinking, well, I'm gonna go back in there. But like here, I mean, I can speak for both, um, that we really found our community that it wasn't your community when you were living here when yeah. you were a teenager. So like finding so I totally understand that, but and I but I could also see them. Potential, yeah, I was, I was kind of the one of seeing the potential because I couldn't see Florence as an option, as I mentioned, like I'm from Florence and we wanted to move to a family or the other because we want to start our own family and we, we cherished that and we left so young and we felt at times that, um, you know, again, because the dance world sometimes can be bubbly it was hard for us to like uh, find a connection with the country we were leaving. So we were like, okay, let's move to either or to either one of the family. And here just like made more sense for like possibilities. And I'm not talking about possibilities of like the American dream and, or like economic possibilities. I'm talking about possibility of expressions because I know that there is a lot to do still and the fight is not over for any minority but um italy is way worse and the gay marriage is not recognized they just passed civil union last year yeah. i wouldn't be able to like you know move we wouldn't have been able to start our own business i would have had to yeah. either study there get a job before going in exactly. order to legally be able to go there and the gender dynamic is really really um embedded in the culture and even my friend who are like came out to them when I was 13 and are super open-minded I find myself sometimes like I almost want to say like disappointing on them it's not that I'm disappointing on them but like that I feel like I'm not there anymore I'm not with them anymore you know in a lot of in a lot of things and um so it just made more sense to, like, to be who we are being here. And, and I'm honestly, for multiple reasons, because we started our own space, because we found our chosen community, because we, we kind of like had a start, like, like a, a fresh start. I have never been so free in my like expressions of like my gender and who I am, like as I am right now. And I feel like it's kind of like a, an accumulation of all of those things. And but I understand that, that it's a privilege. It is a big privilege because yeah, not everywhere is like that. And yeah. yeah. So well, and I think Columbus is happy to have you too. So we're yeah. glad you're here. Um, so next question, can you tell us about your movement practice? And then the second half was about your flux and flow work during the pandemic. So you've told us a little bit about that, but what is your movement practice like personally? I say that it changes for sure. Um, but I think both of us have as a common movement practice ballet, but an approach of ballet that um, has a more contemporary mindset. So adjusting some elements to really make sure it's about focusing on 
connection to the ground, focusing on flu yeah. fluidity of the port de bras, yeah. um, and really th making it as a connect as a way to connect to movement and fully connect all the cells in your body, rather than um, you know trying to do the fifth position like I did when I was seventeen. You know, um, so. And, and then I think and beside that, we have different things. I really, um, I do a lot of yoga. I enjoy doing that as a way to take care of like my joints and knees and improvisation. I've always been a few, few, big fan of um, just improvising, putting on music. And so that's also something that I, that I do and enjoy yeah. doing. For me, yeah, it's ballet, it's something that um, I'm ballet, you know, ballet how we, how we preach it <laughs> you know what i mean I'm, it's how i i'm comfortable connecting with my body but um i find out that a lot of it like when i when i for example like work on like abs on like the core and like the center of my body and i cherish that part of my body more then my body feels um better so like some I, I like to do that sometimes although like it's hard to keep a schedule and like i often well out fall out and I'm like, oh, it's been two months I didn't do any arms. Maybe I should get back to it. But that's normal. <laughs> so it happens to everyone. <laughs> but um but honestly the classes that I teach that we teach at night, like for me are because, great. Yeah. They're a great yeah, because in ballet I fully show because I really want them to um I really want the people who are in class to um I want to give an example of like how it can feel and how yeah so and 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 i love so it's like for me it's hard to like hold back sometimes and then for like jazz and contemporary like other kind of dances like we really dance it out yeah. because because for us it's therapy too you know it's like it's it we need it and it gives so, people if you let loose fully it's also giving perm permission to everyone there to let loose so like i do a class dance karaoke and i like try to be as silly and ridiculous and all in as possible so that you know, anyone can feel any level and, and entitled to, um, to to take that on as well. <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't even mention dance karaoke and the dance forms that you teach, but dance karaoke was invented by the two of you. And can you just say a couple words about dance karaoke? Yeah, dance karaoke um, was, is the idea of trying to think of like, what can we do that feels connected to the work that I, was doing kind of choreographically, but then also like approachable for anyone who doesn't have potentially any um, technical experience or previous experience with dance. So I, when I'm generating movement, a lot of times I'll find a melody of a song that I really um, connect to. And I'll put like a specific body part, like, like shoulder on one note into the chest, into the back of, you know, the neck or something. And so I build like, phrases based off of songs and then you can take the songs away and like that's a, a lot of how we generate movement when we create pieces um, and so I was doing that in my creative work and then I was like well I can just do this with like really awesome fun pop songs that everyone knows and instead of trying to be like okay I'm gonna like move the back of my earlobe we're just gonna like do something that kind of says and feels the music so um, in, a, in a more kind of like you know, big, clear way. And, and so the spirit is, you know, we close all the mirrors and um, you're welcome to sing along if you want to, but this idea of really like, get, like singing a song in karaoke, but with your body. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, you don't have to sing it, but it's almost like, it's a mix between singing in your shower and dancing in your room. Yeah. <laughs> Put them together. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, I see that, um, Danielle is saying that, reminding us about the children's movement. Yes, we, we have mainly adult classes, but we also have creative movement who Mara <laughs> is the amazing. Guides beautifully yeah. and the community is so grateful and we are so grateful to have you with yeah. us and part of this because it's been, um, it's been really a nice experience for the kids, for the parents, and for us to have you like as part of the space. But so we do offer at the moment one class a week on Thursday and it's on Zoom or in the studio because yes, we do have 
in-person classes. We're kind of like, a, we're doing like a hybrid virtual and um, in-studio with maskers required and we have a limit amount of um, space in, in, in here. So I think it's like eight students. And um, yeah, so we're, we're, doing, we're doing that for now. But yeah. Great, I have, a, I have one more question, I think, unless any more come into the chat in the meanwhile. But um, this, this may be a particularly tough question right now, but I'm, I'm sure it's a question that has been in mind at other times and you probably still think about um, how, what is next for Flux and Flow? How do you envision the future of the center and of the company? So starting with um, the company, something, for example, like the, the project, um, um, cause this is something that we started to think about it before the whole pandemic. So I'm going to start from there, which is something that it's a little bit more defined. We are at a point where we, which we, we coming out of a company, the only thing we knew was like a company based like structure kind of. So we were going for that and we realized that that wasn't what, uh, we wanted. And just because it's, um, harder to control the environment. So we really felt like empathy for like directors, you know, and, and people who are doing that because it, it's hard. And we felt that it wasn't what was, what made, made us ha happy at that, yeah, at that I, point. And I think we started repeating in small ways some of the same cycles mm -hmm. that we were trying to get mm -hmm. away from. And then we were just aware of it and realizing yeah. we were doing that. Um, so we're at a point like, where we want to be yeah. like the two, like the the two of us, and this and the project is collaboration with artists, which is, can be the artists from the community of Flux and Flow, it could be other professional dancers in 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 Columbus or musicians. It's just like a co like a, a series of collaborations with other artists. Yeah, and and also I think what's another thing that we kind of decided is we were really trying initially to like produce, 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 almost this pressure of, cause we were always in dance companies where there was a season. Mm -hmm. So you had this pressure of, I need to do X amount of shows a year. And so when I finish something and I, you know, and now we're having this thing of like, that we want to make sure that we kind of go one project at a time and then you know, you have to plan ahead a little bit, maybe think one ahead, you know, like we're doing this now and we are going to do a collaboration um, with Counterfeit Madison uh, and work with her, which is really exciting. So we know we have that ahead, but rather than trying to like pace it in a way um, that we're trying to like keep up because we were doing that a little bit, which was something that we didn't like about um, about the, the dance world when we were working as dancers. Mm -hmm. So that was also the other reason. We, we don't really want to be like a company where we have X amount of dancers with a season. We want to have projects, we can apply for grants, we can um, you know, get to know artists and then decide if it makes t sense to collaborate in these kind of um, individual contexts. And do you ever work with visual artists? We actually haven't really yet, but I mean, we are working with um, one right now because we're working with Doug uh, Caraway for, um, to make a video. So we are working with someone to help us uh, to create this work. So this is kind of the first time that we're making something yeah. that's like, it's the first time we're ever making video, which is also, by the way, a whole other challenge, yeah. which was really terrifying um, because I feel like we have a really good sense of um, in live performance kind of um, guiding energy and like, knowing what to focus on, how long something can last before like something can surprise it. Mm -hmm. And I feel very confident in that. But then with video, I feel like my confidence is completely something yeah. else. So it's good that we have, if we ever want to work in a specific way, it's nice to find an artist who can um, offer perspectives and knowledge that we don't have, yes. which is like what's great about Counterfeit Madison because we worked with her on a piece with CDT, uh, Columbus Dance Theater last, February, mm. and she totally brought things that we hadn't imagined, and it was really exciting, yeah. which is why we wanted oh, yeah. to work there again. I think to add about the video, though, is that um, it's super interesting because um, sometimes when you shift um, art form, then you kind of like, or at least for us, like we felt that we were empty 
but then it's really interesting like now working with the video like treating a video as a performance and as a live performance which is what familiars to us then brings like gives us a like a voice it gives us a tool to express something you know yeah. what you know what i'm saying like sometimes you think about well, well this is a video and i'm a live performer like and i don't know what to do but there's like a lot of yeah. stuff in between that can interlace in like different arts form that mm -hmm. i think is very interesting and yeah. enriching yeah kind of reframing and rethinking um your creative habits can be so valuable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, knowing that, that and it's funny, because we already, it's like you're starting this space. Neither of us had run a business, and we're like, we're not business people, you know? But like so many of the um, lessons that we learned from being in a dance company in just terms of like being detail-oriented, having a certain level of professionalism required, like having this thing of like wanting to do things well, all of that information is totally transferable, you know? And we, we realize, and it's the same thing where a lot of, the skills and ideas that we have can transfer to video. And it's just like a little bit of a learning process of adjusting and figuring out how, and there's just more problem solving, which is, I guess, you know, it's a good thing because we get new skills. Yes, absolutely. Well, this has been truly wonderful. Um, just uh, somewhat selfishly for me as curator of TRI, it, I, feel very aware that tomorrow's archival collections and research opportunities are today's artists. And then also to, to see the things that you're tapping into that um, the community is so connected to. That's a real model for me for um, what I think Beth and I want to always be doing of um, making this these traditions of dance and theater that we're in accessible to audiences. So just thank you so much from from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and talking with me. Um, and I think we got some great questions and great comments. Um, if you haven't looked through the chat, there's some really positive feedback in there. Um, somebody loves your nails. One of you, I can't see your nails in my view very well. So <laughs> that's entire loved it. She had to go to a meeting and lots of thanks from people. So, um, so I think this was wonderful for everyone who attended. Look for an email if you want um, a link to this event and all of the library's events that will be coming. And if you would, if you were here today and you enjoyed the conversation, um, TRI is offering another similar event. We're trying to, to do as many of these as we reasonably can. And so next month on October 6th, please join us for our next virtual event, which is a conversation between um, playwright, actor, and director Ted Lange, uh, best known as the bartender on Love Boat, but he's done a lot of work since then. Um, and he will talk about his creative work during COVID-19, and we will discuss highlights from his archival collections that are held at TRI. So um, thank you everyone so much for being here today. If you, um, I think, uh, we have the, Q put the link to that event in the chat, and it's, um, if you just want to find out library events, we have a lot going on right now. It's library.osu.edu slash events. Um, so pretty easy to remember. So thank you again, Russ and Filippo. Thank you, Beth and Q and OSU Libraries. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you.